and welcome to Nocturnal Transmissions, the fortnightly podcast that brings you dark tales both old and new, performed by voice artist Kristen Holland. A quick bit of housekeeping before we get to this fortnight's featured episode. If you are currently supporting Nocturnal Transmissions through our Patreon page at the Acolyte or Cohort level, and have not as yet sent us a picture to include on your official membership card and screensaver, we will be going ahead and sending you a name-only version of the aforementioned items over the next week. If you do, in fact, wish to have your picture included on your card, well, what have you been doing? Send it immediately, my dear. Speaking of our beloved acolytes, we have three more we would very much like to welcome to the fold, as it were. Vasilios Ephthemiades, Tarek Atkinson, and Tomas Hernandez. Welcome, and thank you for your support. Now, back to the matter at hand. We are lucky enough to receive many submissions from talented, generous writers, kind enough to offer up their wonderful work to be considered for inclusion on the show. I simply can't tell you how much we enjoy receiving these stories, which we read with great interest. Now, it is true that only a very select few of these end up being performed by our humble narrator, but I would like to restate that our selection process is not by any means a reflection of our estimation of the quality of the work, but merely a byproduct of whatever may happen to inspire the fickle and flighty mind of our humble narrator. Why he would be placed in the position of arbiter over anything is a mystery to me. But if world politics have taught us anything, it is that authority is seldom the progeny of meritocracy. But I digress. The following story was submitted to us late last year, and it did indeed spark a flame in our humble narrator's mind. Here is the resulting conflagration. Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present The Voice in the Garden by Richard Michael. Part One I used to spend a lot of time gardening. Feeling the dirt on my hands brought me closer to myself. I didn't need to be anybody for anyone. There are no expectations from the earth, aside from a little love and affection, which was something I could handle. It made me feel useful. Except people weren't supposed to live deep under the dirt. I heard his voice every morning calling my name, begging me to dig. He said he could show me how to be happy, free. At night I'd sit up in bed contemplating those words. I considered digging, a means to an end, questions answered. I decided it wasn't a good idea and thought it best to retire my gardening hobby, at least for now. I'd stay inside for a while, find something new to kill the time. Not long after the blackouts started, I'd lose periods of time, sometimes minutes, sometimes hours. A few times I came to mid-conversation with my wife, Natalie, We had been talking for some time, that was clear, but I had no idea what about. She noticed immediately. I'm sure the look on my face gave it away. I woke up in the garage one morning with a shovel in one hand in the act of opening the garage door and probably headed for the front yard. Whatever was underneath the ground 
was going to have me dig him out. One way or another. I decided being conscious was probably best. I timidly walked over to the garden and started digging. After a few minutes I heard nothing, saw nothing, which started to ease my mind. I dug a bit more before hitting something firm. I pulled the shovel out of the ground. There was blood tripping from the pointed end. I threw the shovel down and ran inside. The voice shouted for me to come back. It was screaming my name. Nicholas. I told Nat I couldn't manage my depression on my own. I wish I'd come up with something better, something less accusatory. Being told you aren't the solution to your partner's problems is tough, sometimes impossible to digest. Nat was hurt by that, I'm sure. But sometimes a lie hurts less than the truth. She suggested making a doctor's appointment, even offered to make it for me, but it wouldn't have been enough. I juggled the idea of telling her about the voice. I don't know if she would have left. In the end, I guess I was too afraid to find out. Part 2 The ticking of the clock above the pantry door racked my brain. Tick. Tock. It was getting louder. Tick. Tock. Close your eyes. Breathe. Fuck. Nat, say something before I scream. I was back home for about two weeks and I needed something to keep my hands busy, my mind focused. I laced my fingers together over and over. I had to keep them moving. Idle hands are the devil's tools. Dishes clinking in the sink caught my attention. My wife's soft, soapy hands glimmered under the ray of sun coming through the kitchen window. It looked beautiful, like liquid diamonds. The bright walls of the kitchen gleamed with innocence, like a symbol of a clean slate, something I very much needed. Sweetie, you okay? Natalie asked. She was looking down at her working hands in the sink. But my silence must have concerned her. Her reflection rippled in the water as she scrubbed a pan. How about you get back in the garden? She asked. Come on, it'll keep those hands busy. I frowned. You know what? She said, drying her hands with the dish towel hanging from the oven. I have a surprise for you. Nat. Please, wait, if this is something for the garden, I, I don't think it's a good idea, I said. Her caring eyes met mine. She smiled sympathetically before walking towards the garage. I was going to wait until later, but uh, you should have it now. She opened the door and flicked the light switch. In the centre of the garage lay a thin baby tree, wrapped with care in plastic. The roots were wrapped in soaked newspaper. Thanks, I said. I tried to sound genuine. I think it was enough. She cared about me, my wife. Nat tried hard to make me happy. Maybe too hard. It seemed exhausting. I was jealous of her strength. Guilty for being so much work. Nat leaned her head on my shoulder. I held her and ran my fingers through her hair. It smelled like coconuts and the ocean. I closed my eyes, pretended we were there. 
What's it called again? You were going to plant one before, you know? She said, twisting a corner of her lips. A lavender twist weeping red bud. Fancy, Natalie said. Well, it'll bloom as beautifully as you in no time. She took my hand ever so gently and pulled me over toward the little tree. Come on, Mr. Green Thumb. Time to get back out there. My skin crawled at the thought of that horrid voice screaming my name. What's wrong? I thought you'd be excited to get back to the garden, Natalie said. I could tell she was disappointed. No, it's nothing. I am, I said. Nat stared at my anxious hands. She didn't know about the man in the dirt. His tempting words, begging me to dig. She clasped her hands over mine. Nicholas, Natalie said. This is good for you. I'll be right at the window. <laughs> Promise? I asked. I bought a new book to read while you <laughs> play outside. I'm prepared to never leave that window. You won't be alone, okay? My hands finally started to relax. I nodded. You have to promise to check on me, I said. A lot. I'll be looking up every couple of minutes. Unless I gotta pee, then you're solo. <laughs> but only for a bit. Natalie chuckled. You know how much I love my coffee. Natalie grabbed a book and made a pot of coffee while I reluctantly gathered a few things. The damp clumps of newspaper bunched up around the roots still looked nice and wet so I rested the tree on the porch in the plastic wrapping until the hole was ready. I looked up to see Nat sitting at the dining room table with a favourite mug, she and her book. The coffee inside the mug was steaming. The smell of fresh mulch and topsoil calmed my soul, just like old times. I stuck the shovel in the dirt and took a deep, satisfying breath. It's just a hole, I said, pulling the shovel back out of the ground. This is just what you need. I stared at the sharp edge of the shovel and the clumps of dirt falling off. I glanced back up at Nat, flipping another page of her book. It's just a hole, I said again. You're better now. Each strike of the shovel into the ground sent a rattle down my spine. Nat was taking a sip of her hot coffee. She smacked her lips in satisfaction, looked up at me and waved. I smiled. I felt ridiculous. She furrowed her brow and gestured a thumbs up as if to ask if I was okay. I nodded. Hey! It was a familiar voice, the one I didn't want to hear. <laughs> Look! It said spitting out a mouthful of dirt, pieces at a time. You're not real, I whispered. It's just me. You're not real. Bullshit. Look at me. No, I said. I raised the shovel and brought it down hard into the hole. I danced around, awkwardly bent over on the tips of my toes, trying to maintain my balance. It spoke calmly. Still here... Look at me. Sticking out of the dirt was the bottom half of a pale face. The shovel had sliced its cheek, spilling blood into the soil. He wasn't visibly bothered by the wound, peeling chunks of dirt from between its teeth with its tongue. No! I shrieked. Well, keep digging. I've been waiting, he said. You're almost there last time. I knew you'd come back. Natalie's mug was no longer giving off steam. Her book was folded over on the table. That was gone. Maybe she went to the bathroom, like she said. My fingers fluttered like anxious moths flying into a pale, buzzing light. 
Look at me, he said. I came to my knees and leaned over the hole. I started digging again, this time with my hands, pulling the dirt away to reveal the rest of its face. Its bulging white eyes studied me. Ah, there you are. He looked just like me. I wanted to kill it, destroy the madness and fear that had consumed me. I stabbed the shovel into the top of its skull, cracking it wide open. More blood was spilling into the dirt. Its eye bulged and went bloodshot. I'd prefer if you used your hands, gentler, he said, unfaced. I spun the shovel flat side down and smashed his head over and over, grunting and heaving like a wild man. His head, my head, was a pulpy, swollen mess, but it still didn't shut him up. Why are you trying to hurt me? I haven't given you any reason, it asked me. The words popped from its mouth with small, dribbling bubbles of blood-tinged saliva. How the fuck are you still alive? I asked through gritted teeth. His head cocked to the side, spilling the contents of his skull over into the hole. There are many things you will never understand in this life, Nicholas. The head was rocking back and forth while it spoke, pushing the dirt aside enough to reveal its shoulders. If you <clears throat> dig me out, I can help you be free, Nicholas. I felt a sizzle in the back of my head. I couldn't break away from its gaze. Why do you look like me? I asked. Uh, it makes things <laughs> easier. His grin stretched ear to ear. He had demanding, glowing eyes that looked like they could set a fire if he stared long enough. Makes what easier? You don't want to be this way for the rest of your life, do you, Nicholas? I swallowed the question hard. No. And what about Nat? He asked. I wonder what she thinks of you. I mean, she puts on a great face for you, Nicky, but I'm betting she gets tired of your shit. Why should I trust you? I asked. His eyebrows shot up, forming lines in his forehead. Do you trust yourself, Nicholas? The shocks in my brain were growing stronger. My head was beginning to twitch and jerk. <laughs> I don't. Well, I think it's time you gave it a chance, Nicholas. My brain shook inside my skull. My head was spinning. Everything around me was shaking, transforming into erratic, blurry lines. The azaleas were in full bloom and blended into one long, stringing mess of colours. As my eyes began to close, I looked in the hole once more. It wasn't smiling and its arms were free. Part three. A crescent moon tore a brilliant round slice of light through the black sky. The plastic wrapping on the porch looked different, rearranged. Something was wrapped up inside and stacked in a pile against the porch railing. On the porch sat the man from the ground, rocking in my chair. He was swollen and still bleeding. Patches of freshly scabbed flesh padded the side of his temple. His naked skin was deathly pale, covered in thin blue tangled veins. What the fuck did you do? I exclaimed, scrambling to my feet. My feet felt soaked. They slipped around inside my shoes, making squishing noises as I made my way to the porch. Under the porch light, my shoes were covered in blood. 
wrapped in that plastic sheet were perfect, gentle hands. The soapy hands that shimmered in the sun just this afternoon. I set you free, he said. The wood panels under the rocking chair creaked loudly in the silence between words. You've been a prisoner all these years, he continued. You and I both know that. I struggled with the plastic, trying to rip it open. Frustrated, I tore a chunk off with my teeth when Nat's arm spilled out and rolled down the porch steps. Panicked, I chased after it. My hands were burning up. I had broken blisters all over my palms and the inside of my fingers. The garden wasn't right. The plants looked wrong. It all looked wrong. You've always had a green thumb, the man muttered. It's beautiful, really, what you've done. Pieces of Natalie were planted all along the garden, in place of the azaleas. Feet, fingers, parts I could no longer recognise, were sticking out of small, raised piles in rows. Natalie's head protruded from the hole I had dug. Her mouth hung open, her eyes closed tight. Fuck you! I'll fucking kill you! You're fucking sick! I said. Spit hung from my chin. Tears I couldn't hold back stung my eyes. No, Nicholas. We are free. He said, rising from the chair. I felt a nauseating sense of relief as I lost myself again. He was coming towards me, slowly descending the steps. His eyes were fixed on me. They made me lightheaded. I turned to look at Nat, face to face. Her head was morphing into multiples, spinning and swirling into one another. I'm Sorry, Nat, I said, before everything went black. The rising sun woke me, and I immediately looked over at the porch. The buried man was gone, along with the plastic wrapping. I didn't know where the man went, but I didn't care. Things were quiet. I felt free. I stood up and checked the window for Nat. Her book was still face down, next to her mug on the table. The garden looked just wonderful. Nat was right. This is good for me. I knelt next to the baby tree planted in the ground. Strands of long, black, silky hair stuck to its frail, twig-like branches and danced in the breeze. It smelled like coconuts and the ocean. The Voice in the Garden by Richard Michael. If you'd like to find out more about this author, please visit our website, nocturnaltransmissions.com.au and seek him on our featured authors page. Okie dokie, time for Nocturnal Transmissions Recommends. The segment where we recommend to you matter of a dark nature that we have been enjoying and wish to share with you, gentle listener. A pleasure shared is a pleasure doubled, after all. 
I wonder if any of you chose to listen to the Dolly Parton's America podcast as we recommended to you last installment. If you did, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Email us at nocktranspodcast at gmail.com. Yes, I know this particular recommendation was not at all of a dark nature. Let's consider it the exception that proves the rule. Do you love pen and ink drawings set in Edwardian England with a bleakly surreal sensibility and a morbid misanthropic bent? Then you simply must acquaint yourself with the work of American writer-illustrator Edward Gorey. Why, only recently, while sheltering inside during a bleak bout of autumn morning rain, we happened to sweep up a couple of Mr. Gorey's Amphigory collections to while away the time, and we were finding so much pleasure in his deliciously mean-spirited tales that we thought we simply must recommend Mr. Gorey to you, gentle listener, on the off chance you were not yet familiar with this marvellous artist. Those of you who love the alphabet but hate children will particularly enjoy his lovely little book, The Gashly Crumb Tinies. You know what? Here's an extract. I is for Ida, who drowned in a lake. J is for James, who took lie by mistake. K is for Kate, who was struck with an axe. L is for Leo, who swallowed some tacks. M is for Maud, who was swept out to sea. N is for Neville, who died of ennui. Oh, gentle listener, if I could but conjure up the accompanying illustrations through spoken word, I have no doubt you would run at breakneck speed to your nearest bookseller that you might be afforded the opportunity to add a copy of this little treasure to your library. As I mentioned, we have been enjoying a couple of his Amphigory collections. These volumes collect together his macabre illustrated short stories for your perusing convenience. I believe there were four of these at last count. Amphigory, Amphigory 2, Amphigory also, and Amphigory again. Do indulge yourself, gentle listener. Pouring over the stories of Edward Gorey in the morning while it's pouring with rain. Nocturnal Transmissions recommends it. This episode was brought to you with the generous assistance of our cohorts. Evan Dooley, Michael Wood, Sam Bell and Robert Troy Hampton Peterson. All non-public domain stories are featured with the permission of the authors. All voices and production are concocted by Kristen Holland. Until next time, as always, watch the skies, fear the dark, and don't trust anyone. Especially yourself. Good night, gentle listener.